and welcome to another episode of Cryptid Ramblers Podcast. I'm Callum from Basildon in sunny Essex, and with me as always, thank goodness, live from the Essex Riviera, is uh, <laughs> <laughs> is Scott from even sunnier South End. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're here for episode four. Um, just a quick thank you again to everyone who is listening and, and following us on this journey so far. Um, as always, we're both surprised and thrilled to be back for another episode and, and talking more about these cryptids. And as, as you said last week, uh, last week, last episode, Scott, we'll probably mention that every time we do one. <laughs> yes, we will. Uh, Absolutely. You'll probably just become a force of habit <laughs> in, uh, in the future. Um, and yeah, we're, we're looking forward to jumping into the to the next uh, the next cryptid. Um, and for those who did listen or have listened to episode three, um, you'll know who we're going to be sort of covering. Not the Jehovah's uh, Witnesses. Not the Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> at least to know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that'll be in a future episode. <laughs> but um, but look, for everyone else, um, we're going to be talking about the Men in Black. Um, I suppose it's uh, important to start with a disclaimer. Um, we're not reviewing the uh, 1997 film starring Will Smith and uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Um However, the encounter we will be discussing in more detail certainly was a strong influence on the uh, films and I think the comics that actually preceded it, which uh, I yeah. didn't realise. Very um, much so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so might as well just jump straight into the uh, the origins. Um, the So the, the men in black, or MIB, uh, are supposedly men dressed in black suits who claim to be quasi government agents um i, I won't lie I, I had to google what quasi meant <laughs> or quasi meant. yeah um <laughs> well they you... straight don't exist no names and no fingerprints exactly right oh. yeah no <laughs> names <laughs> and uh, known only by a letter <laughs> yeah just one letter <laughs> just one letter <laughs> um yeah but it basically just means that they try and resemble a government agent or official to kind of seem more authoritarian or you know to kind of blend in a little bit more with i guess their you know their their purpose um it's widely reported that different to the film uh, they actually harass threaten or even sometimes assassinate ufo witnesses mm. um the purpose of this is to keep ufo witnesses quiet from what they have seen or of course witnessed or experienced um this is certainly apparent with the encounter woody derenberger um and uh, the guy that we're going to be covering today, Albert Bender, had, um, which we will cover more sort of shortly. Um, the term "men in black" has also been used quite generically, um, not just for, for, for you know those types of encounters specifically, mm -hmm. um, but basically for any individual who is suspicious, um, either uh, sort of dodgy looking or with you know suspicious uh, intentions. Um, yeah. claiming to work for a government department. Because um, I think it's important at this point to note that, certainly from what I've read, and I don't know what you've found, Scott, but they never claim to obviously work for a specific department. They never name where they're Agreed, who they're working yeah. for. Also, they, they, you know, Men in Black is something that's been given, uh, you know, a term or a name that's been given to them. They don't, they never introduce themselves as working for a particular branch, a particular government, or you know, even, the, even having that sort of classification. Well, I found that they often say, you know, we're part of the Air Force or something along those sort mm. of lines. Or we are wear FI, that attire. You know, yeah. 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 Or we're Absolutely. FBI or something like mm. that. It's, but they don't actually, because obviously it's all compartmentalized um, yeah. and it's all various different departments, but they never say, oh, we're from this branch or this department. It's just a quick flash of the ID. We're Air Force, right? See you later. I'll put that yeah, back. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I think a lot of the suspicion sort of arose as well because they always would pop up in kind of middle America towns where, you know, smart suits and slick hair and tanned skin, you know, at that time wasn't necessarily well known. So they carried a, an mm. air of suspicion with them anyway, just just for the appearance before they even spoke or you know, um, made their intentions known, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah they always very, looked um, off as it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Um, now, although we're going to be talking about a more compelling uh, encounter, 
uh, a little later on, I thought it might be worth just covering uh, what I've found to be um, certainly the first um, publicised or well-reported um, okay. encounter. Um, as I'm sure you found as well, there are you know sightings that date back right to the sort of the New Testament. Yeah, um, yeah. With, there's you know, parts in the New Testament that is, it was. We discussed this before we actually started recording. Yeah. That it the 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 Bible is full of um, potentially alien content. It know, is more so than I ever kind of knew, or or even you know. Wow, well, I'd never really read it. Um, you know, it's well, that's it. <laughs> it's I've, I've not. <laughs> You hear a lot about it it. and yeah, you you hear sort of various passages. The the ones that a lot of people that are interested in the UFO Mm. um, phenomenon, they often go to like the book of Ezekiel where, you know, it it describes some sort of craft with wheels and turbines and such and such. Um, But also you mentioned before about the book of Enoch. Yeah, I was actually put onto that by a um, a, a, a listener of the podcast actually when we talked about various things. And yeah, and she actually mentioned... The, the sort of the book and it just blew my mind that something I'll give a shout out so uh so heavily uh so, say again go give a shout out so, yeah, so praise case. where praise is due aren't you praise where praise <laughs> is due yeah so thank you to uh, uh to brenda who's a, a keen listener from what i understand thank uh, you very much the, brenda uh, podcast hailing from the uh, us of a and um excellent yeah she um yeah in, in conversation um actually mentioned uh yeah, she actually, actually mentioned it, and I—I I mean, you know, it's up in the air as you know, with religion and that as a, you know, as, mm. a, as a kind of standpoint anyway. But we, when she, you know, started mentioning, you know, alien abductions and UFOs and all this sort of heavy influence, then um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I sort of jumped straight on it, and it's it's probably a, a book that I'm going to buy in the in the future because that it, that's really quite an intriguing um, indeed story, especially with the ties into. Yeah like Noah and his ark and all that That's, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not saying it's aliens, but no, it's, it's aliens. aliens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that guy, what a guy. Get, he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To isn't it? Is that, is that how you say yeah. his name? To yeah, From uh, ancient aliens. Yeah. Let's get him on. What a hero. Yeah. <laughs> George, come have a word. <laughs> That's it. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, so this, um, this, this sort of, certainly more modern uh, publicised um, encounter um, with the Men in Black occurred in 1947. Um, the claim comes from a man named Harold Dahl and his friend Fred Chrisman. Um, they were at Maori Island, uh, which is in Puget Sound, or Puget Sound, in uh, Washington State, uh, US of A. Never heard of it, so I've probably butchered oh. the... So, yeah, you quite likely yeah. butchered that one, mate. Yep, yeah, quite likely. <laughs> um, <laughs> both men were harbour patrolmen on a workboat around Maori Island. Um, whilst patrolling the area, they saw six donut-shaped objects in the sky. Ah, yes, um, I did hear about this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the objects then reportedly dropped a substance that resembled, at the time, lava or white metal when it hit the deck of their boat it broke one of their arms and killed the dog that they had with them uh, on board Harold Dahl then claims that he was approached by a man in a dark suit who asked him to not talk about the incident so here there you are supposedly straight away and in black yep um the two men told their story to uh, a chap named Kevin uh Kenneth Arnold who is a known aviator Mm. who seemingly believed their story uh uh, you know, at face value. Um, although it was, it was widely believed that neither Dahl or Chrisman were actually harbour patrolmen at all. This is where the kind of the debunking was was mm. sort of started. That, that, that wasn't actually well, there. Trying to find profession. holes in the story. Trying to find holes in the story like, yeah. as to why they were out on a boat. Um, interesting. I've not actually been able to find what their supposed profession was. So, by all accounts, they were they were harbour patrolmen. Yeah, I can't. I've oh, not so found anything. So, 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 Okay, so it's the, 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 the naysayer saying, oh, they weren't harbour patrolmen. Okay, so what were they? Oh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not my job to know. I, I they mean, I, that. I, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I, I certainly <laughs> didn't find anything. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so um, Arnold then invited an Air Force intelligence officer uh, and, one, and one other individual to inspect the metal that had landed on the, on the boat. Um, 
so yeah, so he and the other the other man that he he travelled with concluded that it was just aluminium and nothing to be concerned about. Just Not yeah. molten aluminium. Just aluminium, just just standard aluminium metal. There was no or aluminium for our uh, American uh, yeah, uh, for listeners, our, <laughs> our friends across the pond. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they they yeah they they just sort of, yeah just oh. aluminium. You know, nothing more to it, nothing to be concerned with, and uh, and so they they left. But the interesting thing is that both officers um, that came to inspect the metal died in a crash whilst returning to California. What? Like instantly so that, after going so and inspecting this metal? Yeah, they've so instantly after Yeah, so they left from California, presumably, to um, uh, to, to Washington State, Ooh. inspected this metal, gave their, their findings, supposed, you know, quite easily a, a cover-up to kind of, t- you know, turn them off the scent. They then both returned to California... But on the return or trip, to. <laughs> or attempted to, and on the yeah, in the return trip, die in a crash. Um, now, this is the interesting, sort of the more interesting bit for me is that the FBI then got involved and proceeded to investigate the case further, and they eventually concluded that it was a hoax. It seems that the main reason being is that Dahl stated that he would claim himself that it was a hoax to prevent any further trouble over the matter. Because obviously, if this visit from this, you know, mm. supposed men in black and threatening him to, to not they, sort of talk about it. Yeah. Um, no, well, sorry, are they saying that the, 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 the incident and the metal that, they, that was found was a hoax? They're saying the whole thing than, was a, the whole thing was the a two hoax. officers dying in the car crash was a hoax. The whole thing. The, 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 whole sight, thing. the sightings of the donuts, the metal falling, the, the two people dying in the crash. The FBI have looked into it and have said the whole thing's just a fabricated mm. story. Yeah, um, all right, Mulder. But popular, exactly, yeah. But popular opinion, certainly online, seems to point towards... The reason why the FBI said it was a hoax because it was because they wanted to beat Harold Dahl to it. They wanted to be the kind of the authority on it to say, no, we've done ah, our investigation. We believe that it's a hoax. Point um, scoring. And, and that's it. Whereas Dahl had already said, apparently, to, um, uh, to the chap, uh, Kenneth Arnold, that he would, he would come out and say that it was all a hoax to get the attention off of him because mm. of what this mysterious individual had, had said to him, you know, only, you know, sort Must of, have said something pretty bad. Well, exactly. Um, it, I mean, what kind of lends itself to the whole hoax bit is that it, um, it also um, is claimed that uh, the two guys, so Harold Dahl uh, and Fred Chrisman, um, did approach mo- multiple news outlets and publications to help spread the story in the hope of earning some money and getting some kind of notoriety from it. Um, mm. But then it was actually later claimed by the uh, CIA that, that the metal fragments of, that hit his boat were actually from a nuclear reactor and they were subsequently um, seized by the CIA. So it was radioactive. So it was radioactive material that fell from the sky onto, onto now, his boat. That makes sense with regards to other UFO encounters where people have had radiation, um, like poisoning uh, or traces, burns as well, and burns, yeah. And actually, you know what? That's that's going to tie in with a little story I've got later on. Yeah, I knew a, it would. Um, yeah, yeah I've yeah. got something that it's. Um, that's why I thought I'd mention it because that I thought was the sort of the clincher for me because, it, as you say, it does tie into other encounters and, and other sightings, not even just with the, the men in black. Yeah. And it also does tie into the story that I know you're going to go over um, in the in the next... Uh, yeah, the and that's a segment. story from like the year 2000 as well. So right. that's okay. relatively, well, it's only what, yeah. 21 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Relatively so, recently. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, okay, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I thought that was quite good. So yeah, as I say, this was um, the, the sort of the earliest... Uh, reported or, or certainly well publicized um, encounter involving a, a visit from the men in black. Um, the most compelling, however, we, we feel happened five years later. Um, listeners won't be surprised to know that this encounter takes us back to uh, you know, good old West Virginia 
Um, <laughs> and uh, Mountain Mama. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> should, we should work for the tourist board of like West Virginia I, or something. At this yeah, point. I'm gonna. Well, I'll buy shares in West Virginia if I can. Yeah, all that. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy real estate. I think at this point, uh, <laughs> you know, you never know. Um, and so, yeah, this this uh, sort of quite nicely segues into into your segment. So over to yeah. you. Yeah. So um, I my research took me um, into trying to find the first uh, reported uh, sighting or, or encounter with the with the men in black, and uh, turns out I didn't do that. You did that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what I did find was uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Albert K. Bender. Now yes. in 1952, he's quite a prominent figure in regards to the UFO community. So in 1952, he was the, one of the founding members of the IFSB, so the International Flying Saucer Bureau. Mm. Um, he set this up after years, about 11 years of researching UFOs um, and trying to get a global effort um, mm. because he, he found that no government was releasing any information. There was, it was hush, hush. It was quiet. There was a huge UFO flaps in the forties and the fifties across North America. Um, and he felt like he needed to take, it needed to be taken upon by the civilians to yeah. actually do it, um, to go yeah. out there and get the information themselves. So in doing that, he, he decided to uh, start this organization. Now, from the moment that he started talking about organizing something like this, he started to get strange occurrences. Um, now, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on Albert. He was in his 30s and he yeah. was still living in his mum and stepdad's attic. So he That's had right. his own little room. He's quite an eccentric yeah. fella from the what fact, we yeah. from what we can understand. That's for He's sure. a yeah. collector of of curiosities shall we say yeah very he used to yeah. call his room <laughs> his bedroom by the way <laughs> the hall of horrors or something or the circus of horrors yeah um because yeah. he'd have things like shrunken heads and artifacts from across the world all weird stuff that you know you yeah like um there's a shop near us in leon c called cranfield's curiosities oh, okay it's, i've got them on, on facebook i've uh, it's brilliant they said all like taxidermied stuff and Weird oh, artifacts and whatnot. It it's, 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 it's yeah, so a lot cool. of the stuff that that um that Bender had was um like replicas. So the shrunken heads were just would obviously just replicas of yeah shrunken heads and and yeah some. He was very proud of it as and, well because he'd, oh, like, he he'd come into my hall of horrors and he was he always like, turned it into like a walk through like Halloween maze. Yeah, sort of thing. So, so he, he turned in, it into like an experience. Yeah. It's in the loft of your mum's house. All right, calm yourself down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <It's just> a, <laughs> exactly. So yeah. he, he's kind of like the equivalent of the uh, the thirty year old playing Fortnite in your mum's basement. Pretty he's much, like yeah. The fifties equivalent, yeah, of that really. But yeah, yeah so so he would start finding these these odd occurrences when uh, yeah. he was looking into it and started talk of starting up this bureau. Um, yeah. weird things like having odd feelings that someone's watching him get the prickling feeling on the back of the neck um, the smell of sulfur as well yeah. uh, was also known in, in that is absolutely older yeah. accounts as broomstone um, right, okay. and also he had a he had a personal radio as well um, mm. and the radio was always on but it was never set to a, a frequency that had a station it was always yeah. a, an in-between frequency mm. now just before he actually set up this um, this organization, the IFSB, he had his first encounter in a theater. He decided to go and watch um, a sci fi film. Yeah. Um, as he's sitting there, he's, you know, there's not many people in the auditorium, mm. and he gets that same feeling and the prickling on the back of his neck. Yeah. Um, and he didn't notice anyone come or go, but suddenly he felt someone sitting in the seat to the right of him. And like, right next to him and uh as he looked over all he saw was just a man looking at him mm. directly at him and he had two eyes and the eyes he says look like two small flashlight bulbs yeah that's right and the image that comes to mind is um what's the doctor's name in ghostbusters 2 
Yeah, I know. What you That's mean. the yeah. image that comes yeah. to mind where he's where he's going down the corridor and he's looking, and it's. And he I mean, that stops, used to freak yeah, me out as a kid. Oh, it used to scare me rotten when I was younger. Gave yeah. me the right willies that did. Yeah. That's the image <laughs> that comes to mind. Yeah, exactly the like, same actually. Yeah. And uh, it's Doctor Janusz. Doctor Janusz. That was. Yeah. That's, I think that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. This came to me. Yeah. Yeah. He's um. So he blinked hard, like not really believing what he's seeing, like thinking, oh, okay, maybe the geezer's wearing glasses and it's reflecting. Mm. Yeah. So he blinks hard and suddenly no one's actually sitting in that seat. No. They've disappeared. Right. Mm. He's like, oh, that's weird. And then he looks over to his left and suddenly he's sitting in the left looking at him. Yeah. And he starts questioning himself. He's like, mm. did I, what's, what's actually happening here? So it unnerved him a bit. So he, he got yeah. up and he moved away. He moved over to another part of the auditorium. Well, it was, it was that feeling of being watched, wasn't it? So when he when he turns and sees him on the right, obviously that spooks him because he didn't see or hear anyone walk in and and take up the seat. But then when he he sort of blinks and he he disappears, he has that returning feeling of I'm being watched, or you know someone's someone's kind of looking at me. And that's when he, as you say, he sort of turns and he sees that he's appeared, you know, right next to he's him on the other side, on the left. Yeah. So again, he didn't see or hear anything, but there was yeah. just that that mental. And it's important. It's important to note that even though the auditorium was dark, he was he still knew that the the guy was wearing a dark suit, yeah, and he was wearing a hat. That's right. And he says it's the the Hamburg style hat, yeah. um, which is kind of like a trilby, but with the 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 flat rim rather than a, yeah. a curved up, kind of like uh, a rim. one of the pork pie hat that. Yeah, that sort of yeah, kind of like kind a Churchill like sort of hat. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Winston Churchill hat. So yeah, he's he's he got a bit freaked out by this geezer sitting on his left, and he went up and sat somewhere else in the auditorium, and he was just like, "Oh, giving me the willies, you know? Mm. What's going on?" He's running it through his head. Oh, am I just getting a little bit freaked out because I'm watching a sci-fi film, or I don't know yeah. what's going on? Then he get that. Then he got that feeling again. Yeah. And as he glanced round directly behind him, yeah. the same person was sitting behind him burrowing his eyes into the back of his head. Yeah. And that's when he freaked out, got up and went and spoke to the manager. He um, did. It was quite funny in the audio book, actually, the way the, the narrator <laughs> read it out. Is he, he, the, you know, Albert Bender said he, he, he went and spoke to the, um, the, the theatre manager and actually felt very stupid, you know, mm. telling him about what was kind of happening. Because, you know, he, he was a guy in his 30s. He was in there watching a sci-fi film anyway, mm. And then he's telling this this manager that oh actually you know there's a guy in there freaking me out because he's following me around. You know, following <laughs> there's me a around bigger boy in there. The he's scaring yeah. me. <laughs> and when exactly, but well, that was the sort of the feeling that he had. He he accounts um, or sorry, recounts in the book that when he mm. goes back into the sort of the auditorium with the the manager, the guy isn't there at all. So he's wandering around with a torch walking behind the manager. Yeah. Feeling like a bit of a tit, no doubt. Feeling like a bit of a Muppet because yeah, there is actually no <laughs> one there that he claims to have uh seen. So I think he says that in his moment of embarrassment he, he just takes any old seat in the, the theatre, waits a few moments for the uh for the manager to walk out of the, the room <laughs> and then he actually leaves. <laughs> yeah he's like he, yeah I'm he, out he now. Bolts I'm and he goes, he goes he goes like, yeah I'm going <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which is fair enough, actually. You know, I'd enough, probably, yeah. I probably wouldn't even got the manager. I would have just gone, I'm, going. I'm out now. Yeah. I'm off. Bye bye. See you later. <laughs> well, so this this plagued him for a couple of days. This being on his mind, thinking, God, that was so weird. You know, like because the idea of looking at the phenomena and then it looking back at you hadn't even occurred to anyone at that point in time. I think it was no. John Keel in in the late sixties that really probably coined that sort of terminology that mm. it looks back at you and uh, it starts investigating you. So a yeah. couple more days like, go past and um, they have one of their first meetings for the IFSB. That's and right. um, it was at his mum's house mm -hmm. again. Um, and everyone had left by this point. So he was fixing himself like a sandwich or something like that. And uh, he could hear footsteps upstairs. Mm. He's like, oh, well, well, maybe not everyone's gone. Maybe... Actually, someone's come back because they've forgotten their coat or their hat or whatever. That's right. So he goes up there to check. And as he gets to the top of the stairs, he sees a strange blue light emanating from his bedroom. Mm. So his bedroom door was always closed. He was a bit, a bit funny about that. Yeah. That was something that he, he mentions quite a few times in his book. He does. Um, yeah. He's very uh, fastidious 
I think that's the right way of saying it. Probably mm. mispr- mispronouncing that. Probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he called out, like, like, hello, is anyone there? And the blue light faded. And as he entered his room, the radio was on again. Yeah. Odd, um, odd frequency being, being tapped into. And the distinctive smell of sulfur, burning rotten eggs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. Which, um, again, as you mentioned earlier, crops up in not only other men in black encounters but you know ufos other yeah. cryptids even bigfoot i think we may have mentioned it in the in episode oh, there's lots one of them about bigfoot yeah when you have a sighting of any kind of creature or cryptid cryptid which is you know otherworldly or certainly not of, of this world as we understand it, it it comes with that that kind of smell which yeah as you say is likened to either rotting eggs or is yeah it's just sulfur mm. yeah so it, that's that's something that tends to tie in a lot of this sort of phenomenon yeah um but the one thing that I did notice as well, and I was really quite surprised at, at reading about this, was um, his World Contact Day. So right. on the 15th of March, 1953, he had organised with his members of the Bureau from around the world mm. to collectively send a telepathic message to ET species. Yeah. So he knew that there was flying saucers out, out and about and, and that there was something that wasn't quite earthly about it so he thought okay well if these creatures don't communicate the same way we do and telepathy at that time was something that was being studied a lot Mm. he two and two together and went okay well let's try a telepathic message um it wasn't a compulsory thing for members of the bureau to do but it was something that he invited them to do and um it's a long very much along the same lines as the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind protocols that Stephen Greer is promoting at the moment. Yeah. Um, I won't go into that bit because we've already spoken about it. We and have, you know what yeah. I think about, <laughs> yeah. about yeah. Dr. Stephen Greer. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I will think I'll leave that for a later episode. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the idea is that you get yourself into a comfortable state, even like a meditative state. And you attempt contact collectively. So he had everyone coordinated around the world at very specific times to all do it at the same time. Yeah. And there was quite specific instructions as well, wasn't there? So I don't know if you're getting onto that, but it was, but did they have to make sure that their eyes were closed? They were laying right. down and they mm. emptied their mind of any, any kind of thoughts or. Yeah. So that's that what, right? that's what Something the meditative like that, state it? is. That's exactly yeah. what that is. Yeah. So being able to find that, that, balance mm. in in the meditation um which as you know is something that i do quite often yes you, you know I, that. I, yeah, I, I do love to do a bit of meditation and in particular i love to do the the wim hof technique the wim right. hof breathing technique it's just it's brilliant it's a great way of getting yourself into that 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 balanced state where okay. you can just let your mind go mm. um and that's the the idea of it and is he said that once you do get into that state, this is the message that you need to pro, um, need to project. Yeah, and it goes it goes like this, and it does sound like a radio broadcast as well. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. Call in occupants of interplanetary craft. Call in occupants of interplanetary craft. Interplanetary craft that have been observing our planet Earth. We of the IFSB wish to make contact with you. We are your friends, and we would like to make. We would like you to make an appearance here on Earth. Your presence before us will be welcomed with the utmost friendship. We will do all our power to promote mutual understanding between your people and the people of Earth. Please come in peace and help us in our earthly problems. Give us some sign that you have received our message. Be responsible for creating a miracle on our planet to wake up the ignorant ones to reality. (laughs) Let us hear from you. We are your friends. End of message. (laughs) <laughs> if you imagine that that's been sent by letter or <laughs> telegram around the world to the 600 odd members that the IFSB had, that's a long ass message. To, well, to, can you imagine, to, right? If this was really, that, you've got if this was really a closed. thing, right? If this was a real thing, right? Because that's, that's what he said. So he sent it out in um, well in advance so that people could yeah. memorize the message. Um, but could you imagine it, right? If this is actually real when it did work <laughs> imagine some yeah. alien somewhere on his craft having a shit 
Yeah. And then suddenly this voice, these voices come out yeah. of nowhere. The broadcast is like, well, hang on, give me a bit of privacy here. Boys. Like a Bruce Almighty moment where he just hears <laughs> yeah. 600 voices in his head. And he's just like, what? <laughs> and that's the bloody message of everything that you could say. I mean, I thought it was a bit long winded. And it also, it kind of reminded me of the, that pretend um, radio broadcast that they did for War of the Worlds back in, back in the day. And oh, the Orson Welles thing. Yeah. Well, they didn't tell anyone that it was a, it was a story. They'd done it as though it was a genuine radio mm. broadcast to sort of shit people up, basically, and scare people. Yeah, yeah. The, well, the way the way I've got it opens a theory about up, that. That was an experiment all day long, mate. Yeah, definitely. But that's where they. Um, but that, that reminded me of of that when when you read the first couple of lines, it's very. It, it kind of loses its way as you get towards the end of the message, but it starts off very kind of authoritative and very kind of you know, sort of matter of fact. And then I, I mm. think it kind of loses its way. But you imagine you've been this sent This is that. a government alert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you've, and you've got to read that thing. Like you've got, to, you've got to clear your mind. You've got to close your eyes and you've got to just sort of lay, lay down, but you've got to somehow also telepathically, which I think is important to say, mm. telepathically broadcast this thought or this message, you know, out into space. And like, there's no way you'd be, be able honest. to do that without reading from the, the note. Yeah. Let's be honest, let's put human error into it. So the message that's probably going up to these aliens that they're receiving is glum, 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 because all these different people, I mean, you've, you get a, like a, a crowd in an auditorium to all say the same thing and you can't, yeah. it's not going to happen. timing will be off. Yeah, people will start when others finish and vice versa. And, you so know. the aliens probably went, oh, fucking hell, what the hell was that? What and he it seems like after the, his third attempt of actually doing it, mm. um, he seemed to have actually made contact. It worked, yeah. It seemed to yeah. have worked, based on his words. Um, so after his third, a third attempt, um, he began to feel that strange tingling feeling again. The smell of sulphur started to mm. waft in, um, which is important to say as well. It lingered for two days as well, that smell of sulphur. He tried everything. Yeah. He tried sprays. He tried perfumes. Open, leaving the windows, yeah, windows open, open. Yeah, just it. stuck in there. Mm. Um, and as he was, so he was still in the meditative state, and he and he says that he started to get blue blinking lights swimming around in the darkness of his mind. Mm. Um, and he started to feel weightlessness. That's so right. he started to almost feel like he wasn't lying down on his bed that's right yeah. and he started to get a throbbing pain behind his eyes and he started to get incredibly cold and i quote this like laying on floating ice in the antarctic ocean mm. antarctica i think is going to come up a few times in this yeah definitely. um so clearly he's having an outer body experience yeah. there really or the phenomena that's known as an outer, outer body experience and then someone who's he's... probably not been to the antarctic that's quite a on the nose description of what he was feeling at that time. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's put in there purposefully. I think that's a little breadcrumb to be honest, because yeah. there's a, a little bit later on in the story it does. that that's right. it, he alludes to the location. <clears throat> that's right. Yeah. Um, he alludes to a location and I believe Antarctica is that, but we'll go over that in a little bit. Yeah. So he actually does actually get a voice from the darkness. So with these blue lights um, dotting about him, uh, he gets this voice, a booming voice that says, we have been observing you and your activities. Please be advised to cease delving into the mysteries of the universe. We will make an appearance if you disobey. We have a special assignment and must not be disturbed by your people. Mm. We are among you and know your every move. So please be advised. We are here on your earth. So... Again, it's that idea that we're not, he hasn't really alluded to the men in black at this point. No, not at this point. There's certainly a threat. You know, there's a threat from another. We, we will make an appearance if you yeah. disobey this. Mm. Um, and so after this voice has finished off what he's saying, he's kind of blinked his eyes open a little bit and he vaguely saw a dark shape of a person near the end of his bed. Yeah. But as he rose up, it had completely vanished. Mm. Um, but again, the smell of sulfur and his radio was on. It was set to a frequency that, he, you know, that wasn't showing anything at all. It wasn't one that he would usually, well, not, not only had he not turned it on, but it was also set to a frequency that he didn't use. Mm. Although he didn't set it to a specific radio station, 
the frequency in which he always set it at was different to the one that the dial was on when he when he investigated it. And it, it also right. recalled not actually turning it on because he was trying to get into that meditative state. Obviously, he didn't want anything, any background noise or anything to kind of interfere. No. You'll, you'll get a bit of white noise with that, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah, All right, so the next encounter follows a two-week vacation. Um, so after he returned from this vacation, he walked up to his room. His door was locked because, again, he was a bit funny about about his bedroom and his, his stuff. Mm. So he would actually lock his bedroom door. Yeah. Um, he entered and there was a strong smell of sulfur and the radio was on again. Mm-hmm. But the radio had been clearly radio had been on for two weeks and it was incredibly hot. He said it was and he wondered why, you know, how there wasn't a fire or anything right. like that. So he, he actually questioned his stepdad. He was like, Has anyone been in here? You know, this is this ain't on. I was like, no, no one's been in there. You must have left it on by mistake. You know, there's yeah, no one's been up there. Just calm your, you know, wind your neck in, boy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those, yeah. those sort of things. Wind your neck in, boy. <laughs> wind your neck in. I'll give you something to shout about. <laughs> um, so he's he's set his bags down he's unpacked and everything he's settled down for the night um and those blue lights started floating around in his room yet again and it accompanies this odd feeling of being watched and he's starting to think to himself like this ain't right I've got, there's got to be a problem with me i'm starting to hallucinate then three shadow figures form in his room and they are floating about a foot off of the floor yeah this is something that's a bit weird this is something that we don't often hear about with regards to men in black stories and these are three men in neatly pressed black suits brand new black suits as well yeah. hamburg style hats that partially cover their faces but as soon as they fully appeared his fear left him he had no fear whatsoever. It was just completely calm, which again, that's something that's very mm. odd to flip mm. from fear of, yeah. oh my God, what the hell is that? It's forming over. And then nothing at all, just pure acceptance. Yeah, especially when you consider that their appearance is only of a, you know, harassing or threatening nature mm. because of but their warning something prior. that happens a lot. So- this is something that happens a lot with the Men in Black encounters is that, mm. oh, that's a bit weird. They, people only get freaked out after they've left. Mm. like whilst they they're there they're, not, yeah. they're just calm they're just answering questions they're you know uh, they're, nothing they're, seems they're, out of the ordinary does it it seems fairly no, sort of they're just the accepting their requests time. and yeah, stuff like that exactly, and yeah. again that's again I'll, I'll talk about that in the later encounter yeah. as well about just how how um, persuasive these men in black seem to be mm. um, so Whilst they're still there and his fear has left him, their eyes begin to glow again, like the little flashlight bulbs. Yeah. And they say to him, one of them says, you've done some good work, good research. You're an average person. So no one's going to believe you anyway. We have no fear because you're no one of any renown. Yeah. Like, kind of like a double-edged sword, really. Like, you know, much, we're coming, yeah. we're showing ourselves to you, but it's because you're a nobody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Bit of a back end, oh, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. I've, hang on. I've started an organization, a global organization, yeah. Yeah, be still a nobody. So, I... I don't know if you know who I am, but I'm kind of a I'm big kind deal. of a big deal. <laughs> 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 I've got a lot of uh, leather bound books, and my office is full of rich mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's actually from Burgundy, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, he uh. They then go on to just say they give him another one, another warning of do yeah. not disturb us. You know, you got to, you got to stop delving into these these mysteries. Um, and they also go on to say that what you see here is not our real form. That's it's right. not our true form. This is how we present to you because because of the sort of beings that you are. Mm. We don't want to you know scare you too much, but we will have to if we must. Yeah. Then they go on to say, and this is something I found very, very interesting. We have made numerous contacts with Earth through means of craft from our base. And at present, we have craft hidden in our base in a remote spot on your planet. Just on a remote spot. 
we have found it necessary to go to great extremes at times to frighten off your earth people, and it has resulted in their deaths. So I want to harken back to Antarctica. Yes. And them having to frighten off earth people and resulting in their deaths. Mm. Now, something that we've spoken about previously on, uh, not on podcast, but in general conversation, Operation High Jump and Admiral Bird. Uh, yes. Admiral Bird, now, yes. I've got a feeling that remote spot that they're talking about is Antarctica. Is the one that he saw. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, we've gone to great extremes, like, you know, wiping out nearly 30,000 men in 1947. Yeah. Um, so again, this is after the, the, the second world war in Europe at the very least mm. had finished. Yeah. Um, but I just thought that was, that was very odd. And I, I kind of made that connection a little bit as I was listening to it, that it was a remote spot, but you've taken, gone to huge extremes to, you know, scare them off. Scare us off and, yeah, put mm. us off the scent, as it were. Yeah, and they go, look, we're not going to give you names either. We're not going to give you our names, but you can refer to us as one, two, and three, and we will answer you as such. Mm. They then give him a, um, a piece of metal in the shape of a coin, so something like about a, a 10 pence piece. Right. Or um, for our American listeners, something like, like a quarter. Right. Was a very similar in size, okay. and he says it's it's odd because it's very very light in color and very very light in weight, but incredibly strong, incredibly hard. He even tried to file the corner off a little bit, right? Uh, it just broke the file. Um, and they said that you with this device, with this piece of metal, you can contact us, but you have to do certain things. So apparently, he has to hold it tight in his hands, close his eyes, repeat the word "kasik," mm. and then turn on the radio. So it's this use of the radio, which I think is very odd. Yeah, I, I was trying to make the, you know, sort of connection, you know, with that. It is, does it kind of, does the radio wave kind of help with the telepathy of, of the whole encounter and the, does it heighten it in some way or does it open up a, I think a it channel is a, between them both? I, absolutely. I think yeah. it is a way of, because it, it seems to um, allude to the fact that it's a way for them to, um, to travel almost okay. like he doesn't quite say it in the book but it's almost like they travel on the radio waves mm. and again this ties into the story that I've got later on with regards to yeah. radio waves um, yeah, exactly. and that, well, think, that will become and, apparent later on well I think that's probably I mean kind of clutching at straws but but kind of not but I'm, I'm thinking that that's possibly why they drive older cars when they approach people in in other forms of in, encounters mm. because they have the old transistor radios in them and so they've always got a yeah. constant access to a, a, a radio wave um to enable yeah. them to either travel or, or communicate when they well, it is they all hear. about frequency isn't it well exactly so yeah. if we exist on a certain frequency now this this is gonna sound really new age you know, you've got to raise your vibrations and, and all of this to interact with these higher beings that yeah. technically are on a different frequency because even light in itself, light is yeah. waves. It's a frequency of waves. Exactly. Um, and that's that's scientific fact. Um, but don't hold me to it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scott quoted but, yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get me uh, get out of jail free card straight in there. <laughs> um, I'm kind of over, overrunning a little bit on this, so I'll I'll kind of dart through this this last bit. Now he does in a later um, later contact. It, it starts becoming a regular thing. He starts initiating contact, holding this coin. Yeah. Um, and he late, goes on to later describe what these creatures actually look like. Now. Yeah going to give you a quick description they are approximately nine to ten feet tall mm. they are mostly green yeah and they've got a, a, a strange almost triangle shaped a teardrop shaped head mm. that is red now if you want to google an image that closely resembles whatever it is it's the flatwoods monster of west virginia yeah again going back to west virginia again. Staying in West Virginia, and can't uh, get out of the bloody another, place. <laughs> another, another, all, all unintentional, but it's, um, yeah, it's it's another cryptid, you know, in itself. I mean, when I when I first read the description, I don't know what you thought, but it was actually the Martians from Mars Attacks that 
popped yeah. into my head with like the I higher, had... with sort of the higher collar, the you know the sort of the, the bulbous light bulb. Well, I had yeah. I had a mixture of that and the aliens from Independence Day. Yeah, that's what they I had. That's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I had that same sort of teardropped shape head. Yeah. Obviously, they they've got an exoskeleton and whatnot. But mm. I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. That true. these things. Um, but at mm-hmm. least these men in black seem to be alien beings. They're not. Yes. They're, and it kind of um, reminds me of Galaxy Quest as well. <laughs> yeah. This is uh... not our true form. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love that film as well. It's such I love a that superb film. film. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, to get back on topic. <laughs> <laughs> He he has a lot of he has a lot of interactions with these beings. Um, so he much does. so that they actually do take him to their. It seems like they're they're based on Earth, um, and they say that they they do they are refining the seawater. So there's something in our yeah. water that they want, and that's a prominent thing with regards to UFO um, sightings and such that people have seen them over water or um, coming from the water. So yeah, from, or, from or, out of the water or into from it. out of the water or actually drawing water up into mm. the craft. Um, mm. But it seems like these these creatures they don't have the same water on their planet, so they've they've found what we've got, but they're keeping themselves quiet. This is their yeah. special mission. It seems that they're going to refine all of this water, yeah. or uh, they're taking something from it. He doesn't go into details, but he takes something no. from it. Well, they don't um, confirm what they use the water for. No. But, they, but they they tell him that they take it, and they show him how important. they refine it, and that it's important to them. But he's but mm. there because it were he the, the 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 kind of the, the leader. I think the the exalted one. I think as he's referred yeah, to in the one. in the book, um, yeah. basically says to to Bender that you know you can ask me any question you want, and I'll freely answer it if I want. Truthfully as well. Truthfully as well. But if there's a question that I don't feel. Either, you know, if there's a question that I don't feel I should answer, or simply that I don't want to answer, mm. then I won't. And, and, yeah. and you kind of have to accept that because he does ask him, "What do you use the water for?" And he's like, "I can't tell you that, but I have shown you that we take it, where we store it, how we yeah. refine it, and kind of where it ends up. But I can't, I can't tell you what we use it for." Which I thought was quite interesting. He sort of takes yeah, him, it's, it's almost like he has like a he has like a bit of an interview with him, and it's it, he even the it's exalted very much one. Like that, yeah. Well, this is this is just it. I mean, it's I don't know how many um, UFO encounters you've read, but a lot of them have this sense of I am worthy of them, that sort of thing. So even in his telling of it, he's like, and the exalted one um, remarked on. Um, the quality of his questioning you know ah yeah, very good i question. see you are a man yeah. of of intelligence and you have asked this question and it's yeah um yeah there was a I, lot i don't of, know about that uh, it's, a lot of self-righteousness of and yes a lot of kind of well it doesn't go in his favor does it it doesn't no because it's kind of like you know I, i've had the experience because i'm worthy and because you haven't had one obviously you're not worthy enough or you know mm. you're not intelligent enough or you know, yeah, that that kind of thing. So yeah, it doesn't it, it doesn't but, put you in his camp to go, yeah. you know kind of support his every word when you know when it's kind of like that. But then you know this 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 being this exalted one does comment again a few times that they're only entertaining these questions and you know having him aboard their craft because he's a nobody because he doesn't yeah. have any influence and they're quite confident in the fact that if he was to go back to earth and tell people of this encounter and this story the general population wouldn't believe him mm. and feel that and feel that he's making it up and so they're quite confident that they thought well yeah sure after after they obviously there was that initial threat but yeah. then once they then actually they realize... met him then they realize they're actually you're a bit of a nobody so yeah great mm. go and tell everyone no one's going to believe but, you anyway <laughs> but that confidence doesn't hold for very long doesn't hold for very long and i'll explain no. why no or how how that confidence how doesn't uh stay so he has several um encounters with these men in black before he's either transported physically or mentally um or telepathically transported but these three same men in black turn up every time 
They're um, always together, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, one, two, and three. They yeah. they they turn up every single time. And they ask the questions. He has a conversation with them. Yeah. And then the last contact was actually a warning to him. And the last contact was, you you really do need to stop this now because you're not listening to what we're saying. Because at this time, he, he Bender is still quite a prominent figure in um, the IFSB, and he's yeah. Much, people it's, are it's gaining a lot people of people starting yeah. to chatter. People starting yeah. to chat and going, oh, hang on, what's, what's been happening to Albert? You know, he's mm. he's been acting a bit strange recently. He's not giving us any answers. People, are, he's starting to create a bit of noise. Yeah, exactly. so they've said, right, this is uh, this is your last warning now, mate. We have we have to install a pulse within you that would yeah, trigger right. a disintegration instantly <laughs> yeah. if you tell anyone else about us yeah. or anything about what you've experienced whatever you've our seen on this with you. ship wasn't it anything you've seen on our craft anything that we've told you mm. if you relay it to you know to anyone yeah they were like you see that button over there <laughs> if yeah. we pre- if we press that <laughs> cool. you are you're finished yeah sunshine. you're finito you won't, sunshine. <laughs> you won't even hear the noisy cricket mate yeah <laughs> yeah you're out of here <laughs> You won't even hear it. <laughs> you won't even hear it, exactly, yeah. And I thought that was quite... Because it was like they'd... He'd made this communication. They obviously clearly heard it. They communicated back to him and said, we think you should stop this. Don't take it any further. Obviously, he ignored that warning, which mm. I think, to be fair, most people probably would. Um, yeah, we'd all push it. Because you'd be like, yeah, all right, wouldn't we? Go on then, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, you can start an intergalactic war because silly bollocks is decided to send out a communication i'll be like yeah all right so they, they he, he continues he, he he's like you say he's a prominent figure in the ifsb he's you know he's he's a, a, a point in um you know heads of in the organization from around the world so you know someone from england wrote to him and he was like yeah you can be a part of it and i'm also going to make you the the british representative yeah you know, people from other countries would get the same treatment so he was very keen to get prominent figures from all countries to help mm. get the message out so there was, was over issue. 600 members in the bureau exactly yeah at, at its highest which yeah, no, absolutely let's yeah. be honest it wasn't running for very long because of his contact you know so this was exactly yeah it wasn't i think it was only like a was less a than a year after yeah. what you yeah. call contact day yeah it was about um, that yeah. yeah it, it, it wasn't, wasn't long after that until when he got this final this final warning yeah, um which was interesting he couldn't even tell his wife either no, because that was like, one of the you know, in the future, I might look to want to get married. Can I tell her about it? He went, no. We he we'll had met her at this you point. and 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 she she was um she she oh, wasn't the right. she wasn't the representative, but she was one of the British members of the IFSB. And her brother was it was in... her brother who was the prominent figure. And I think mm. Bender had written to him and said, I'd, basically, I'd like to converse with, you know, with, with your sister, will you get her to write me? And that's how it kind of all happened. But yeah, one of the, the questions that he asked the exalted one was, um, you know, in, in the near future, I'm, I'm due to, you know, get married. Um, mm. Will you have any uh, interference or will you, will you disturb my marriage in any way? And they were like, no, we, we won't, we won't, you know, we don't show any interest. But you no. can't you can't tell her of us or we of won't this. we won't initiate any contact with you. Yeah. And we don't expect you to initiate any contact with us. Yeah. And you can't tell And you can't tell anything. anyone, you can't publish anything, nothing. Um yeah. so he decided he was just gonna shut down the IFSB at that yeah. point. He's just like, right, well, I can't he said, I know the mysteries of the universe, I know the mysteries of the UFOs and everything else like that. It, I can't, yeah. in all good conscience, allow other people to research it. Mm. And me say yay or nay or he said I can't do yeah. that without eventually letting my story come out. Exactly. So, yeah, it was like he worth... he'd served his purpose, didn't mm. he? He'd set up the IFSB to to get to an end game, and with, with far quicker than probably ever imagined. Assuming he ever thought he was going to get there, he found out the mysteries of the universe. He'd made contact with another being, and so he thought, oh well, that's. Yeah. That's, that's kind what, of that's, that's kind of me done. I don't and... need to do this anymore. Plus, there's also the you well. Know, I the, think it was more so the the message that he was putting forward was that he couldn't, in all good consciousness, do it, like conscience, do it really to the other people, to the other members of the bureau. Put them in danger. Like, yeah, I know the I know the answers, and I can't as the the the, the chairman or the founder. I can't mm. say 
oh yeah, this article's worth worthwhile publishing, but yeah. this one isn't because what that's doing is it might be a loophole to us, but those aliens they'll just go now, nah, mate. Press the button. No, nope. cool put. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hang on, you are influencing <laughs> where the information goes. So exactly, yeah. In order to keep everyone else safe, he just disbanded it, and rumors erupted across the world. Gray Barker mm. was heavily involved in the organization, anyway. He but was, yeah. He was. Um, he would often contact Bender and and talk about, you know, what's going on, mate. You know, why mm. why has this happened? But it's worth. It's worth mentioning he waited till nine years later before allowing this story to come out. Nine years—that's a long time. Well, it, it was a long time, but I don't think it was necessarily that he waited that long. It wasn't it that he that that he'd moved in, wasn't it? He'd moved into a new to the, the, a new house with his with his now wife. Yeah, and he was sorting through his stuff in in the attic, looking for something else. And yeah, because they he said... found he found his old box um, mm. that he used to keep the the piece of metal that the Men in Black gave him in. That was where that was his safe box, I think he called yeah. it, where he kept it. And I think they always said to him that you'll know when we no longer need you, or we no longer that we're on no your longer planet. on the planet. That's the one, yeah, because we'll take the metal with us. And, and apparently, well, they, well, they the just years... said they just said you'll know. You you know you can't you can't tell your story whilst we're still on your planet. And he yeah. goes, well, how do I know that you've left? He goes, you will know. You will know, yeah. And it's and it's that piece of metal disappearing, that piece of physical evidence. The, the one thing he could go, needed to prove right, it. Yeah. I've got this. You know, can yeah. you do some analysis on this? And you know, if it's a metal that doesn't exist on the planet, then bingo, you've got that, your proof. That is yeah. physical proof of something visiting here that isn't supposed to be here. Yeah. So no, exactly. That, yeah. That had vanished, and that was his. That was his green light to go. All oh, right, okay. They're no longer on the planet. I can tell people my story. Yeah. And you would check um, as well through the through those nine years intermittently. He would check the box, and the coin yes. would always be sat he'd, there in the same uh, position. And you know, and, uh, on this last um, this last check, which is by pure happenstance anyway, that he opened the safe box, and not only was the the coin gone, but all the other possessions and belongings that he kept in the box. And yeah, also disintegrated. Everything. Yeah, just so, ash. Like, so notes and and presumably photographs, because he said he tried to mm. take a few photographs of the of the craft and and of the and of the, the, of the, and of the men in well. black. But he said it was as though the camera film had been exposed to light the before radiation. it was developed, because the yeah. the the print the, the the developed photos would just come out solid black. But he knew at the time he had taken a picture of something, mm. so he f he feels that they'd obviously interfered with his camera roll. Uh, it when seems taking the it coin. It seems that I don't know if you noticed this, but it it seems incredibly similar to Derenberger's encounters, in that he was a contactee that was given information, taken to different places, also allowed to initiate contact. Mm. But there's the the one thing that is very, very different between the two of them is that Albert Bender seems to have received direct warnings and threats where, and he knew where they came from. He knew that they came from these men in black that had appeared to him. Yeah. He knew that they were these alien beings. That's right. Whereas Derenberger, he, he did receive threats from the men in black. He did. But I don't think he was privy to know exactly who they were and where they came from. No, I think because his encounter was as he learned to uh, figure out, or was he, as he was told, were Lanulosians. So injured cold was from this planet. It, you know, they were this race or this species. This is what they look like, which is worth noting that the Lanulosians did tie in, in terms of description, to the the men in black. So the the tanned or olive skin, the slick back hair, the pointed features. Um, High cheekbones, the high cheekbones, prominent cheekbones, slightly bones. slanted eyes as well, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, Oriental, um, yeah, sort of facial features were, were, were sort of described. So, yeah, so it's, it's certainly, um, you know, certainly compelling, and you know, mm. I, I think we've, I think we've sort of glanced. I mean, because definitely, the, we've definitely covered that part of the story. That's oh, for definitely. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the, the two, the two chapters where they uh, Bender actually goes into his visit on the ship. Mm. Is probably about forty minutes worth of 
the the whole book, which is like five yeah. and a half hours. So we didn't want to cover the whole thing in every detail because a lot of it you could he didn't have to disclose. He could have just no, said I the mean, main. If, if you are parts. interested, if you are interested in that part of the story, then it's worthwhile getting his book. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. What's, what's the name of his book again? Um, that's funny. I only listened to the uh, the bloody thing yesterday. And could I Flying Saucers and the Three Men? That's it. Yeah, yeah. So Flying it's definitely worth the listen. You Check it out. Want to see in a little bit more detail what he's told by the, this, you know, group of people. These men in black. This, you know, it's a very fantastical one. Um, story. It really is. Oh, it's incredibly fantastical. M- more so than the Derenberger one. And I thought mm. at the time that that was quite fantastical. And I think this goes, you know, kind of over and uh, over and above. But I mean, look, to, to kind of help give it maybe a little bit of context um, and to maybe kind of steer away from the fantastical and, and whatever else, I was I wanted to go through some other encounters that, that I had found. And no doubt you've come across them as well, Scott. But it, yeah. it, it adds more of a realism to the encounters and more so a creep factor like these are very unnerving very very unsettling and very mm. creepy which is very different i mean they're still the, the kind it's of different the... from the derenberger one i mean i did get a sense of yeah. creepiness from uh, bender's story yeah that, I mean, you know, they just kept appearing to him yeah i mean derenberger did report that he'd he'd had a conversation with two gentlemen that he believed were from the men in black and that he'd received the threatening phone calls but aside from that, um, he didn't really have any much. He didn't have much more involvement, and whether that was because he was in too deep with injured cold, and whether he'd already said too much, because I think by the time the Men in Black mm. spoke to Derenberger, he'd already been on national TV giving his interview. So at that point, it's kind of like, well, you've already you've already done it now. Yeah, we yeah, the, we missed the boat really, on that one, lads. We, we can't really stop you, but can you just kind of hold fire for, for you know saying any more? But yeah. with these encounters specifically, I think they're just a little bit odd. And I found I found these ones to be unsettling. I mean, there are, you know, like with the, um, well, with any cryptid sighting, you know, there are plenty of ones that you could go through. A lot of them are quite generic. A lot of them follow the same sort of pattern, which to me, I think I take with a pinch of salt and think, oh, I think you're just jumping on the back of this train and, and just trying to get yourself involved with the sighting. But these ones, yeah, are quite compelling. And they also tie us back into... Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and a lot of characters that pop up mm. with their own Mothman sighting. So gotcha. It, it, it bridges. Oh, so it ties between. in the Mothman as well. It does. It does. Um, the first one I want to go into occurred on May of 1967, and it involved a Mrs. Ralph Butler of uh, Oratona, Minnesota. Um, now, she says that uh, an officer by the name of Richard French visited her. He was oh. around five foot nine and had an olive complexion, long dark hair, and a pointed face. So, again, the description fits right in with the, the whole. Yeah, and that name's black. familiar, isn't it? And that name's familiar from the Mothman Prophecies uh, book. He pops up quite a few times. Uh, mm. He visited Mary Heyer, um, who's. That's right. A prominent character in the Mothman book, but also in the film. Um, yeah, in the film, she was she's the local reporter, wasn't the, she? Uh, the sheriff, wasn't it? She was the local um, sheriff that went yeah, around Linnies. with, yeah, Laura Linney. Yeah, uh, Laura went Linney's around character. with, um, yeah, that's right. Um, so, yeah, so his facial um, or physical description kind of matches, and also his clothing. Uh, she commented that it appeared to be brand new and, and freshly pressed. Um, he sort of so he knocked at her property mrs butler offered him uh which for me this is the weirdest thing of the encounter she offered mm. him jello um and richard french the, the the officer uh supposedly acted like he'd never seen jello before and didn't know how to treat it whether he how, how these, he should eat it it's um, these weird mon- i say weird it's just mundane things that to anyone yeah, in should, our culture, we just go off guard, but that's jelly, you know, jelly. jello. Um, yeah. we know how to eat that. Yeah. It's one of those things that is no way trivial to us, it's just exactly, so mundane. Yeah. It's not anything you think about. You're like, Yeah, I see that. That's how I, you don't even think about it. This it is the happens. thing, he, but, yeah, so he acts like he's never seen it before and he tries to drink it. So, 
you can imagine. Blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was it's also i mean not so much or just in this encounter but in others it's reported that they they don't know how to use cutlery uh, yes. and, have, and have never kind of come across it before because in another encounter which i didn't go i didn't write down in too much detail but the main compelling thing from that one was that a waitress in a diner had to show a supposed officer of the men in black how to use the cutlery to the point yeah. where she cut up a steak that he'd ordered uh, mm. for him and sort of showed him how to eat it with the knife and fork. Well, even she, she thought was like quiet. before, like she came up to him, said, "What do you want to order, honey?" And he went, "Food." Yeah, food. So, oh, yeah. oh okay, all right. You know, good. Good I shall start. recommend yeah. this. What's what, you know? Would you like what is good? Yeah. How about the steak? Okay, <laughs> and then it's Great. just like it, yeah, yeah. He's it's just, they up. don't understand our customs or anything. And, no, and that is a very very regular thing with men in black encounters. It is, yeah. I mean, so I've just made a note here that we'll see multiple accounts report that the men in uh, the men in dark clothing, mm. um, or you know, the men in black would photograph individuals who had witnessed UFOs. So they might not have direct encounters in terms of talking or any interactions in that sense, but from a distance, they'll be photographed. Um, they would turn up at their home or place of work and pull out a large old fashioned camera. And after setting it on a tripod, a bright blinding light would, would follow. Oh, and then the next thing they know is that they see the individual packing up, chuck it in the back of an old style car and, and driving off. And they're um, uh, saying, uh, hang on, you, you, you know, in fact, you kicked your husband out. You kicked him out. <laughs> because exactly. you're tired of his shit and that's, you know you need to get a decorator thing. in here because damn <laughs> that's the exact thing it reminded me is of that what the, they did? The, the blinky red <laughs> the blinky red light from the men in black film that's exactly what it reminded it's the me the neuralizer isn't it it's the neuralizer but they but the, the difference with this is that they remember them taking the picture but they don't remember anything else so there could have mm. been an interaction there could have been a conversation had but they just don't for whatever reason, they don't remember it. And was it this camera that they would then look directly at or into? Mm. The flash, the bulb flash goes off. In a the person, state person and drives off, and that's all they and that's remember. Something, so something worth mentioning as well: missing time. There was often yeah. missing time that they couldn't account for. So, like exactly, they would, yeah. in a lot of account, a lot of um, encounters. They would receive the the men in black into their house. They would have yeah. these conversations, and like it'd be like two o'clock in the afternoon. And by the time they're leaving, mm. it's you know night. Eleven is, o'clock at night. Night yeah. has come along, and it's eleven o'clock at night, and they're like, "Well, what? it's only been an hour." Well, that's yeah. It's interesting you, you said that actually. But so there was another. I mean, I'll get onto that interesting component in the next one. But this one gotcha. is where it ties in a Mothman witness. Um, ah. which which is quite interesting because it so it occurred on the 22nd of february 1967 so in the in the height of the mothman sort of saga in in point mm. pleasant mothman witness connie carpenter was walking to school when a black car a buick for our american listeners um pulls up beside her the driver opened uh, his door and asked her for directions um, and the driver fits the description of the man in black, or the man mm. in black. Sorry, um, Connie gets closer to the the vehicle to to you know to talk to him. And at this point, the driver suddenly orders her to get in the car. He grabs her arm and tries pulling her into the vehicle. Um, she manages to get away, and her, her blouse is torn in in the process. She runs. She runs back home, and you know, sort of thinks nothing of it. However, the next day, a sinister note was slipped under her door, reading something along the lines of, be careful, girl, I can still get you. And you can actually see well, a picture of the supposed note on Google. Someone has obviously photographed it. And it's oh, just really? On a, it's just on a plain piece of um, sort of paper, and it's written in an odd order. Um, and, yeah, and it says something along the lines of, be careful, girl, I can still get you. Um, now, the interesting thing for me is that Connie Carpenter is the niece of Mary Hire. Ah, she's the one that had the conjunctivitis. Who's, who's the local 
busybody for the most part. But yeah, yeah she's a prominent Con- figure in the Con- Mothman. Connie's the one that had the conjunctivitis, which is um, conducive of yeah. High levels red, of ra- light radiation. Yeah, the red, um, red puffy eyes. She said she That's had for right. a couple of days and she couldn't shift it. Yeah, and Kill um, connected that with UFO encounters, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So there's, so, so there's that one. Um, now, we were talking before we were recording about the a Mothman episode of Monster Quest that I'd watched, where it involved <laughs> yeah. Linda Scarberry, uh, who, as we know, was one of the main witnesses in the first Mothman encounter. Um, mm. Now, interestingly, she pops up um, in the the sort of the Men in Black because they they actually had their own encounter, and this for me is the freakiest one. And I'll go into it and yeah, go for it. Sort of why? Um, so another Mothman witness, as I say, Linda Scarberry, came home from hospital on the twenty third of December, nineteen sixty seven, bringing home with her her brand new daughter Daniela. She and her husband Roger lived in the basement of. Linda's parents' home, um, uh, who the, uh, the McDaniels, who were also quite yeah. prominent in the Mothman sort of saga during that time, because they they too had had their own encounter. Um, so, so during that day, a steady flow of friends and neighbours came by to visit them and to see the new baby. Now, Jack Brown, a reported MIB agent, pulls up to the house and claims that he is a friend of Mary Hire, who who he had visited a sort of a couple of times already and basically tried to warn her off reporting on UFO sightings and the Mothman. And This was the little jittery guy that stutters, wasn't it, Jack Brown? That was it. He was the shorter yeah. of the described sort of men in black agents, but he was... Yeah, because he goes, I, what would you do, 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 if... Yeah. if if someone said to stop looking, looking at, at UFOs, and she went, yeah. I tell them to go to hell. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Because <laughs> she's yeah. a hard nosed reporter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was along those lines that he uh, that he, that he said that. I mean, it's not going to be particularly threatening there, Jack, mate. You might want to sort out your your yeah, your, exactly. uh, your voice sort out your emanator. Delivery. Yeah, exactly. Sort of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your translator's You've got a glitch going in. on there, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah your exactly. translator's packed in, mate. You want to have a word about that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Mary Hire was sort of known as the sort of the, she was a local reporter, but also known as like the, the sort of the town busybody. So that's why he'd gone to her sort of quite a lot. Because if you were going to get anyone to stop, you know, reporting on the men in black and UFOs, it was going to be the lead researcher who was doing so. Um, but yeah, anyway, so he'd pulled up outside their house. He he was welcomed into the home like many other news reporters had been, you know, during that time, certainly since their Mothman sighting. Um, and he carried with him a large tape recorder. He then proceeded to set it up on the kitchen table, um, but it became immediately obvious to those around him that he had no idea how to use the machine. He was fumbling with the switches, didn't know how to kind of you know switch it on and, and, and kind of operate Please. it. Um, but as I say, the family were used to reporters, uh, you know, visiting and, and asking them questions. For the most part, it was about their Mothman sighting, and they were all quite generic. Um, but fairly intelligent questions to sort of help prove their story or debunk it or whatever. Yeah. However, one thing that they noted quite prominently about Jack Brown was that his questions were rather vague and unintelligent. And, you know, as we alluded to earlier, he was quite stuttery, had quite a nervous disposition about him. Mm. Um, He was basically uninterested in the recent UFO sightings and specifically the Mothman and if anything, his only real intention in, in visiting the Scarberries was that he wanted to know whether they knew where John Kill was. Obviously, John Kill being mm. the author of the Mothman prophecies, who yeah. had all I think had already at this point had an interaction with the Scarberries because they went back out to the munitions plant where they'd That's had right. their sightings. But not only did he want to know where John Kill was, but he also wanted to know what his relationship was with Mary Hire. Obviously, both being quite prominent bit, figures in Point Pleasant. Bit of a gossip, then, weren't they? Yeah, basically, yeah, just a bit of a nosy little shit. Um, and yeah, like I say, he was stuttery, he was awkward, totally uninterested in the baby, uh, which had obviously been the main centre of attention the whole day, with it being somewhat of a impromptu sort of baby shower. Um, and he, he turned up sort of quite late in the afternoon, but didn't actually leave until about 11 p.m. that night. So it goes back to what you were saying about 
about there being a loss of time. He'd been yeah. there for a total duration of about five to six hours, but it didn't feel like it at the time. It felt like he'd, he'd sort of been there. He turned up, mm. set up his recorder, asked a few, you know, silly questions, you know, faffed around a bit and then left. But in actual yeah. fact, when they recounted the story, he'd actually been there for five to six hours. He's just like standing in the corner, like keeping away from everyone. Observing, as well, wasn't he? standing in the corner, trying to interview other guests to kind of see what they knew about Mary Hire. And, but because it was only the Scarberries that had had the encounter, everyone else kind of proved to be quite sort of unhelpful. But he didn't ask about the baby once. He didn't show any interest. He's the worst man in black in all he history. Just, yeah, he's, he's got given a the game away. translator yeah. and his, his cloaking device don't even work. No, right. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he's it, he's it, the joke in the office. That's what exactly, he is. Exactly, yeah. He's, he's, he was the... Uh, he was the apprentice that they sent out to get yeah. like uh, tart, yeah. to get like tartan paint or to go yeah, and, look, get a long weight or look look at Brown out there. Look at him. <laughs> look at him, dickhead. Look, look, look at him go. What a prat. He's, yeah. he's obviously got him. They've obviously given him the lost and found uniform because Mary Hire commented. <laughs> lost and found. Do you know what I mean? Mary Hire commented um, in her first encounter with with because uh, it was Richard French and Jack Brown that first visited Mary Hire in her office. And they tried to convince her yeah. to stop writing on UFOs on, on separate occasions. So they have visited her separately. Well, they were with Cause... her. To, they were with her. To, they were together when they went to her office. Um, but then he went again on his own, um, and because he freaked her out because she That's had to go. Right. Yeah. She had to go back. She she basically ran into an office behind hers to grab someone who was working late that night. So he was with her when Jack Brown was asking her these questions because he he freaked her out. And every time he asked a question, he stepped closer and closer to her desk, which was just creepy. And that's it. He had weird, weird black eyes. Weird protruding, dark eyes that he protruding black eyes. Thyroid yeah. eyes is that's how they, it. Yeah, is how they exactly uh, it. Yeah. describe it. Um, but but yeah, she commented like was... on the fact that his outfit swamped him and that the overcoat especially looked like it, it looked brand new, but it looked too big mm. for him. And so that's what made me think of like, you know, like when I don't know, when you when you was at school and you you'd forgotten your 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 PE kit and they gave you yep. whatever they found in the the sort of the lost and found or whatever. Yeah, then kind of <laughs> kind of looked like his uniform had been thrown yeah. together by like his older brother's hand me downs or something. There you go, yeah, you can wear dad's jacket, it'll make you look older. Yeah. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. So um yeah, so I mean they're they're sort of some of the more I would say realistic encounters, certainly less fantastical, but mm. creepy as well. And and they, the, out of the numerous that I've read in the last couple of weeks, they're the ones that kind of stood out to me as as being particularly kind of threatening or harassing or mm. just just downright odd and creepy. Just weird. Well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly exactly like this one that I've got. It's um, this one I've mentioned it before. Um, it comes from the from December two thousand. It's in Vancouver, Canada, and the 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 person that's told this story wants to remain anonymous, you know, because right. he's. I think is. I think he wants to remain anon- anonymous because it's it's a it's an odd story about potentially paranormal things, but also yeah. maybe because he doesn't want to own up to his decisions, right? But we'll right, get into okay. that, uh, Mister Anon. Um, he saw a huge UFO rumbling over his house. Like you could see oblong shaped windows right. in a row. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And almost instantly, mm. he got a phone call from a general in the Air Force saying, "Yeah, don't don't talk about this. We know what you've seen, but don't talk about it." Okay. He's like, "Oh, okay, no problem." Okay, yeah. Two days later, oh, sorry, next day, even two <laughs> men from the Canadian Air Force turned up at his doorstep now they both had olive complexion yep. they both stood around about five foot ten right they both had slightly slanting eyes mm. they both had high cheekbones they both had pointed chins they both had very small lips right and they both spoke in a very monotonal tone mm. so again this is typical men in black men in black yep. description Absolutely. um they quickly flashed their id really really quickly um, put it away. You go, like, oh, okay. And they said, can we get, can we please come in? She goes, oh, sure. Go offers out his hand, like to come on in to my home. Yeah. Um, and they just look at his hand, look at each other and then walk past him. 
So it's like they didn't know what like, the gesture was. What the hell yeah. is that? You know, look. Yeah. What, what is what is this? Again, so, a basic human custom that means absolutely nothing to to yeah. them. Yeah. Even if they it's, were it's, hard-nosed officers of you know a government organization, they would at least keep up the basic manners. The, the, the hu- humanity a, a human, of it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, he he ushers them toward the kitchen. Um, and as they go into the kitchen, they see the microwave and they start freaking out. These two men. Oh, I've read this. They go, yeah, they go, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you've got to, uh, um, you've got to turn that off. You've got to, and he's like, well, you've got to turn that off. Mm. He goes, okay. So he goes around the back, he unplugs it. And then they sit down at the table with rigid backs as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. That's when they can calm down. So the microwave's off now. So all's good lads. Microwave's off. All yeah. right. No panic. Yeah. Yeah. No panic. So, sit down and they produce a recorder a tape player but it's got no tapes but it's got like a small metal disc that about the size of a 10 pence piece or a quarter yeah and they insert it into the side and then they start recording so this is the year 2000 so i mean we have like micro sd cards now which don't they're not discs but they slot into things yeah so it's a similar sort of thing to what we have 20 years on from this point but yeah exactly yeah Here's something that I noticed as well, and I thought it was worth mentioning as well. One of them notices um, a walking stick in the kitchen, and it's carved. So it's got a carving. It doesn't, uh, doesn't detail what the carving is, like if it's a, a yeah. wolf's head or deer's head or, or whatever, yeah. but it's a, it's a carved walking stick. Okay. And uh, one of them says to the other, that reminds me of the primates back home. Oh. Whoa, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> Why is matey not going, what the fuck was that? Sorry, so what? sorry, what? Sorry, 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 what? A primate back home? Yeah, so yeah. You're in the quiet words of the Virgin Mary, come again? <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> why is he not? Why is he not questioning that? Yeah, you jump on that. That's but... where that overwhelming calmness comes yeah. from. Yeah, and it's after the event. Albert, when you think back and you're like, that's when he freaks out by that. that. Hang on, that's, that's what they yeah, yeah. Reminds so, him of primates back home. It's similar to when you have an argument. And it, but it's only after the argument you think, oh, I, sh- I should have said that. Yeah, I've got the best. You think of the that. best, yeah. I would have yeah. tied them right up with that. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're in the shower and you're having an argument with yourself yeah. that you've already <laughs> lost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I get that. That's that sense of um, that calm mm. that you know you're yeah. now suddenly just very, very. You're just going along with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Apart of they obviously these these men in black they're they're wearing the same sort of gear but the the, the main things that are different is that one of them has a tie clip like a silver tie clip with a red okay. flickering stone almost like it's lit up with like an a LED or sort something of thing. But... yeah and the other one's okay. wearing a ruby ring with diamonds surrounding it okay so clearly this ain't the men in black no this is the men in bling. <laughs> oh, here we go. This is here we go. Like you see what I did there? Go. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Very good. So these men in bling also yeah. have um one of them has a like a, a square watch on his wrist. Right. And this what well, it looks like a watch at the very least. It doesn't have any hands or numbers on, on the uh, the face of it. But what it does have is a series of buttons that um that light up in a frequency of red, green, and mauve colours, just in a like a, like okay. a darting sort of light up yeah. sort of thing. So he, he sees it and thinks that's odd, but for some reason doesn't question Again, it. Doesn't say anything. Like, yeah. What's that, mate? Mm. So they, they have like the interview and they do talk about the UFO that you saw. Um, and then one of them does actually touch him, touches his hand, touches his bare skin, and he notes that it was very cold and very, very clammy. Oh, lovely. Now, I don't know. We've all received a wet handshake yeah. in our time. Yeah. Um, and it's always uncomfortable. Yeah. But they, they got up and they left. <laughs> they left and they avoided the microwave again. <laughs> Almost like they're skirting around the microwave. <laughs> you know, they're skirting around the, the microwave, even giving it the side eye, he, he noted right. as well. Right, even though okay. it's unplugged, yeah, it's yeah. not going to get you, lads. Right? Don't worry about the microwave. Yeah. Don't worry about it. It's not going to it's not going to get you. And then yeah, they leave and then they just end up just standing in his front yard. So right. he's closed the door and he's watching them out the, the window in the doorway. He's like, yeah. What are they doing? And they get out the it they get out what's it looks like a Geiger meter. Okay. And they start 
moving around the front garden. So he goes, right, I'm going to go and get a better look at them from the bedroom window. And in the short distance from the front door to the bedroom window, he looked out, disappeared, gone. No trace of them. That right. not down the road to the left, not down the road to the to the right. Around the back of the house, it, nothing like that. They're gone. Yeah, they're just absolutely gone. So wow. a week goes by, and he gets another knock at the door, and it's a a, a guy by himself, and right. it's someone of very very similar description as the first two. It's not the same yeah. ones, but someone same just yeah uh, same same enough to be the same, but different enough to know that it was someone else. This time. He says, hello, my name is Mr. Smith. Oh, now, Smith Mr. is another Smith. one of those men in black names that comes yeah. up. So this guy is a men in black. He's not a men in bling. He's, he's, not, he's yeah. not wearing any bling, this guy. He's, right. he's just in a black suit, black tie. Yeah. Um, Normal dress <laughs> White shirt. Yeah. White shirt, and, yeah. uh, Again, he, he asks, may I see your watch? He's like, mm, okay, all right, no worries. Come on in. You must, so he yeah. comes in and he walks. Ushers in towards the kitchen to the to the table to sit down, and as he walks through the door, he looks over. He goes, oh, "You got to plug. You got to unplug that." Point in the microwave again. Mm. So he got. A, he goes, yeah. Okay, that's what, what is microwave? it with a microwave? Yeah, <laughs> the microwave. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's something about it. They just don't like this fucking microwave, mate. Yeah. I don't know why. So he sits down and uh, he gives him his watch, and he instantly starts. You know, dismantling his watch, taking it apart, looking inside, and he's using these odd tools. And he said he notes that there's one that looks like a, a silver pen, and it emanates a silver beam, a, a mauve beam of light out of the end of it, and he kind of shines it over the back of the watch, so in all the cog work and everything else like this. Then he gets out what looks like a, a small digital camera, starts taking pictures, um, and as he's as he's speaking, he doesn't speak often, but when he does, it's very much slurred. And he's very much right. breathless, mm. which again is another um, characteristic of people's conversations with the men in black. Yeah. Is that they're almost struggling to breathe properly. Yeah. So like right. almost like it's not part of that. They're not used the to this usual atmosphere. atmosphere. Yeah. Um, he goes, uh, I would like to buy your watch. He goes, Well, okay, you can have it, but you don't want five hundred dollars for it, please. He goes, oh, Okay, well, um, I'll have to check with my colleagues. He goes, All right. So up he gets, leaves, um, and again, just vanishes out the, out the front. He just There's no cars that come pick right. him up. There's yeah. nothing. He just, poof, gone. Right. So fast forward to January 2001. Two men, two, two men turn up, slightly stranger features, slightly taller, slightly a bit more, you know, the, 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 the proportions are off, the suits are ill-fitting. So it's almost like they've gone, right, well, the first three that we've sent, didn't do the job we're gonna to have to get the higher ups to come down and do it yeah. but they haven't they haven't prepared as much they're not out in the field as often yeah so yeah. they've got bits wrong they got the the suit isn't fitting right mm. they look a bit different um and they said you know maybe we see your watch i was like okay so did mr smith send you he went yes yeah yeah that's right mr smith sent us okay all right come on in so again go toward the kitchen and they go you're gonna to have to turn that off you're going to have to unplug that. Again, the point so, in the microwave. Yeah. And he's like, right, it's okay. the microwaves actually. Fr- then they, they say, fr- you're going to have to turn the computer off as well. It's at oh. a very low power. They say, it's, oh. it's at a very low power. You need to turn it off. He's like, yeah. Okay, sure, no worries. So, again, they sit down. He offers them his watch. They take the watch. And then they get these little tubs out of their, their briefcases. And they've got little colored tops. And he starts, they start pouring this weird mauve powder over the watch. And they go, don't worry, it's not going to do anything to your watch. Don't worry. But give no explanation other than that. Yeah. So they do that and he goes, right, okay. Um, yeah, we would very much like to buy this watch. We'll give you $250, um, but we'll give you the rest later. And he goes, okay, sure, no worries. Then they get up, take his watch, leave without even paying him. So they've gone and fucking stolen his watch. <laughs> A bunch of tea leaves, haven't they? The tea leaves, mate. <laughs> they got, got up, and he's just gone. Yeah, sure, no worries. Take take me watch, me five hundred dollar watch. You could take that. Oh, right, well, yeah. Oh, I believe uh, uh. I am going to be moving soon. By the way, so you're going to be able. And they go, yep, yeah, we'll be able to find you. Don't you worry. We will find you, and we will give you your two hundred and fifty dollars. So, <laughs> I mean, come on, mate. You yeah. know, like, 
You've fallen for the oldest trick in the book there, son. Yeah. Yeah, we need your bank account details and so forth. Hello, madam. Hello, madam. <laughs> uh, my name is Mr. Smith. You know, he's like, <laughs> like, come on now. But here's something that's worth noting as well. Go on. After every visit from these weird men in black, yeah. plastic things in the house appear to have melted. So... Plant pots had melted in their presence. He said that there was um, the kitchen utensils that were plastic and melted um, mm. in the drawers. Right. Um, so, again, there's, they, they must have been emanating some sort of emitting, radiation. Maybe they were emitting a higher radiation than maybe, say, the microwave, and they were going to be clashing with that, or it was going to be blocking and he their own waves. He experienced intense headaches. And in some cases, a little bit of skin, like sunburn. That is interesting. Yeah. Which is really, really odd. That is, And odd. that's something yeah. that does happen a lot with regards to other men in black encounters is that yeah. people, and especially UFO encounters, is that people receive, I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever done it, like um, had like, a, like been on a sunbed or something like this. Mm. And like going back a couple of years ago, I had to go and have light treatment, didn't I? Yeah, you did. And yeah. the first time that I did it, it was only for 15 seconds. But I came out and I felt like, whoa, I feel like I've been in the sun all day long. Like my yeah. skin felt like it was sizzling, but it was yeah. only for 15, 15 seconds. seconds. It's just Bloody this hell. UAV and UAV, um, UVA even, UV, UVB light hit my skin and it was mm. so intense. So I didn't feel it yeah. at the time. It was only afterward that I came out. I was like, wow, I feel Bloody like hell. I've been in the sun mm. all day long. Mm. But are they emanating some sort of radiation that the microwave hmm. would interfere with? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was like, thinking. Yeah. Would, like if they was in the mic- in the presence of the microwave for too long, it just suddenly explode. Explode or something. Yeah. And Correct. then that gives a up. Encounter. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's already pretty fucking weird. But already, how are you going to explain yeah. like going through three that? microwaves <laughs> in two months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Here's, you yeah, can't... here's two hundred and fifty dollars for your watch, and also we bought you a new microwave. We felt oh bad. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it two hundred and fifty dollars for your watch that we're never actually going to give you. Yeah, yeah fucking exactly. mug. Yeah. See you later, sunshine. You've just Dopey been kid. done. You've been had sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I thought that was worth mentioning because it was just no, definitely again, again, it's just incredibly weird. weird. And they turn out they're they're thieves as well. Yeah. They're so they're not just they're threatening just your odd. life; they're threatening your possessions yeah. and all. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be so bad if they'd explained what the mauve dust was, what they were looking for or searching for in the watch. What was it about it that compelled them so much, really, from what you would presume would be their own technology? What was it about? And why was it well, I reckon they just liked or... a bit of bling, mate. Yeah, probably. They probably saw it was a fancy watch. The, the, yeah, the first two yeah. that turned up were like, oh, I fancy that. Yeah, I want that, yeah. Fancy, yeah we wouldn't be able to replicate that. that. Yeah, let's, see what, let's see what it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, um, thieving bastards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so as you said, it's um it's definitely uh, another weird and, and less fantastical uh encounter with uh, with the men in black. Uh and I think that, that kind of sets us up quite nicely to um get off the fence, I suppose, yeah. and uh, and sort of finally sort of decide what side of the fence we you know we land on. I think um, we both know that we're landing on a particular side of this fence, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh <laughs> Yeah, I think you might be. Uh, yeah, I think you might be right. So, what, what's your what, what's your thought on that? Uh, well, I there's no way that these men in black are, they're not human, mate. They they no. aren't this um, you know Hollywood movie Tommy Lee yeah. Jones yeah. Will Smith thing. It's it's no way. It's it, I, we were speaking about that in particular uh, before we started recording that. Yeah. It's the the importance of film throughout human history, and especially in the last, well, especially through the, the 20th century and going into the 21st century, yeah, is this importance with regards to propaganda. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I do think that the, the Men in Black stories, it's like normalising, it's normalising something that's very, very odd. That Exactly, yeah. These, you know, the Men in Black is, it's not a comic book, it's not a, a film it's not a kid's film to kind of make light of like if you receive a, a, a visit from the men in black yeah they're not you know they're not you are supposed to fear them yes exactly that's what yeah. they're there for they are there 
as a, like a racketeering almost like you know keep quiet and we'll protect you sort of thing but it's there's no way in which that they're human no in any stretch of the imagination no definitely um not. i think i think bender as an eccentric per, as, as as eccentric as he is mm. gives a very very compelling story and I, and I want to allude to the fact that he waited for nine years before telling the story if you had something like yeah. that if you were sitting on a, a story like this for all that time and he's yeah. sitting on it under under fear of death mm. as well that's right so he received a credible threat to keep stum about it Absolutely. and he might have been a bit of a weirdo that lived in his his mum and stepdad's attic and had all like these curiosities yeah. and everything and say what you like about the geezer but mm. i think i do think he's he's there are certainly parts of his story that do ring true. And it's so mm. much so that the phenomena has, has continued up until this day. You know, there's still, exactly, yeah. even to this day, there's still very, I suppose in comparison to what we've spoken about, very mm. mundane men in black encounters, you know, yes, where they turn up, yeah. they look a bit weird. Um, they sound a bit weird. Sometimes they can smell a bit weird, <laughs> Yeah, but nothing of any sort of prominence actually happens other than, yeah. Keep quiet. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Just, yeah, some sort of warning or threat of some description or a cryptid message. Yeah, a sort of up and. Leave. And I, I think is something very, very much more sinister than what the Hollywood movie is is oh, uh, yeah, trying to yeah. convince us to be. Well, I think to it is. It, haven't they? And oh, big time. It and yeah, make it. Let's sing a... songs about it. <laughs> yeah, <All> exactly. That. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly right. And if you've been yeah. listening carefully, you will have heard some of those lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> some yeah, carefully placed lyrics throughout. Yeah, we're the... gonna go dance with an alien after this now. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Um, but no, I think you're right. I mean, yeah, I, I would yeah, certainly agree that the you know the men in black do or at least have existed on this planet. They aren't they aren't human. Um or certainly, certainly not of our human race or our world, you know, mm. just for a lot of the accounts where the basic manners and customs uh, seem alien to them, you know, as much as they seem alien to us and the way they conduct themselves as much as they try to hide it hasn't been, you know, sort of particularly, mm. particularly well how they've cloaked themselves. Well, um, that's, yeah. What, so, like, what were you saying about the yeah. cloaking? Is that something I want to want to say as well, is that yeah. these, these particular beings that, that Bender's been talking about these um, the Flatwoods monster ones. Yes, they they seem to be the almost like the progenitor of mm. because even the story that you spoke about the the first encounter, mm-hmm. yeah, that again the the UFO was over water and it yeah. was dumping something into the water. That's right. So again, it's quite likely that if that is a connection between the two between that encounter mm. and the beings that Albert Bender talks about. Yeah, then it's highly likely that that is what they were doing. They were there refining water and dumping well, the I think material it it into it, angel hair to like filter it or something. Yeah. So anyone that is into UFOs, check out angel hair, and that mm. people have been able to get samples of this stuff that is later on just completely disintegrated. Like yeah. it's like a byproduct of the process that they put the water through, and then yeah. they they dump it out like a like an um, it's like a waste like, material. Yeah, that's just dumping it. waste that they don't, you know, don't need sort of thing. So, yeah, so, so I think so. I agree with you on on I think on on that point. And yeah, I mean, talking about Albert Bender specifically, <laughs> I'd, I I'm in two minds. I mean, as you say, he's got a very compelling yeah. story. He he, as you rightly say, he did wait the nine whole years before really sort of publicising it based on the warning or the the threat that he did receive from the, you know, the men in black, if he was in it just to fabricate a story and have a bit, five minutes of fame and, and hopefully make a quick buck, then I think he would have almost certainly ignored the threats further and fully publicized mm. the, the story and the encounters, you know, regardless. And then and he it, wouldn't it, have climbed, he wouldn't have closed down the IFSB either. Well, no, exactly. Cause that was a not particularly profitable um, organization, oh. but it certainly put him out into the world and, got him notoriety amongst peers. So he, again, much like Woody Derenberger, he didn't need to propel himself into that situation. The situation kind of found him. And so mm. I think the fact that he did wait the nine years, you know, before coming out with the story, I think does give it some weight and, and certainly adds credibility to it. 
helps his the, case, the, doesn't it? The thing for me is kind of how it all started. Uh, you know, as you rightly said in the beginning, you know, he was, you, you know, he was a bit of a loser. You know, a bit of a nerd for the most part. He was in his thirties. He was still living nerd. at home. Nerd. You know, he was still living at home. You know, he, he had his, you know, his room up on the third floor, which kind of ventured into the attic. He had a, <laughs> he had a kind of a separate room that 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 kind of came off of that, which he turned into his, um, yeah, his. his chamber of curiosities that's or, it or chamber whatever. of horrors that's chamber it, yeah. of horrors that was it um you know where he had all these relics and artifacts and you know replicas of and it was and it was through creating that that he started to make friends and people were showing interest in it wanted to come around and hang out with him specifically to see this room to the point where it was starting to become you know like i referenced earlier like one of these walk through horror mazes because of all the things he'd have set up and it would literally right, kind yeah. of be winding through various rooms in the, the upper portion of his house. So part of me sort of thinks, you know, did he just fabricate all this to make friends? You know, did he, you know, did he just sort of see that, Oh, actually I'm getting quite popular with this. So I could, I could sort I, of take this further. That, that, that was could, kind of my, you could probably say that about him setting up the IS, uh, the IFSB in that, yeah. uh, you know, of oh, oh, there are people who out there who are also interested in UFOs, Oh, maybe there's people in other countries that are interested. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, you could probably say that about about opening up that organisation, about opening up the bureau. But but then I think he fell on he fell on the encounter with the men in black unintentionally. You know, when he'd done this thing, he was like, "Oh, th- you know, this will be fun. Let's make up a let's make up a broadcast that we're going to get yeah. everyone to telepathically, uh, you know, emit into you know into space, mm. expecting probably nothing to come of it, and then they could just put it down to a you know a triad." you know, experiment or whatever. But I think yeah. he stumbled across, you know, the interaction with the, mm. the you know, the men in black. And and so from that point, I think from that point on, I think his story is very compelling. You know, there's a lot of imaginative stuff in there that I don't think a general kind of Joe Bloggs would sort of have the state of mind to kind of come up with, especially when it gets down to the conversations, the language used, the, the sort of the questioning that he gave and yeah. the information that he received. I mean, yes, he was into sci-fi and yes, he started up the IFSB, but I, I don't believe he had any real kind of knowledge or expertise or experience to kind of help him on that path. I think what he was recalling from his encounters mm was true and, and happened at that point. I don't think he had any prior kind of research to kind of, you know, like with, you know, I suppose loose, using myself as a, a loose example, being, you know, a, a, a keen or, a, you know, aspiring author, th- th- there are mm. things that I could sit here and, and, and write and using certain language could kind of create it as a pretend event or, you know, a pretend experience and yeah. people could probably look at the writing or the wording and think, well, yeah, you've also just, you've made that up because of blah, blah, blah. But mm. when you listen to, you know, when you read his book and you listen to his, his account, I don't get that feeling from him as much as he was an enthusiast before it happened. I think that's just a happy coincidence. So when I first started listening to it, I was sort of still firmly on the fence and kind of thought, has this guy just fabricated it to make friends and to kind of stop being a loser and, to kind of get him out of his dad's yeah. loft. Do you know what I mean? And to, like to get him out of his dad's attic because he had a mundane, fairly normal kind of middle American life. Well, he was a nobody. And he, yeah, and he was a nobody yeah. as they as they sort of told him. And so <laughs> yeah. and so yeah, I, I, but like I say, the more you go through it, the more I think you find that it is quite compelling and it certainly has some truths to it and yeah, and, and well, he's certainly given rise to the phenomenon that is well. Men in he black. kind of gave, he kind of yeah heavily influenced the the films that that we know and the comic series, the that literature, and even it and even like the the numerous, I mean, thousands, literally thousands of encounters that you can find online, thousands oh, yeah, of them. Exactly, yeah. You know, so if it is something that he has created, he was the first one to create it. Well, it's much like Jerry you know, Crew and the Bigfoot. You know, did his sighting, you know, in in what preceded Bluff what, Creek really, right? in, in a Bluff Creek in the United States was was that sighting of the footprint, the platform that every other sighting across America and the Pacific Northwest, you know, kind of um, you know, sort of emulated from. You know, was the Derenberger interaction with Indrid Cold the start of 
the alien abductions and these more yeah. personalized encounters with either the men in black or you know species from other other planets you, you know if all these individuals completely fabricated it and and kind of made it up then you know they've they've set about you know rewriting they've history set about it in the for, right way isn't they for the for sort of, for the most part and, and i just think it's been going on for too long you know with too many encounters too many recounts through history of of mm. these sorts of things you know happening and and like with the men in black you know i'm i'm not you know, as I'm pretty sure, you know, you're not, you know, I'm not religious in any sense. No, but no. when you read about, you know, the New Testament and other passages of the Bible. Yeah, because that's where some of your research took you, didn't it? It took you into... I could have gone into a real New rabbit Testament. hole with, with it. And, you know, John in the New Testament, um, you know, described what he saw, which was essentially a blackened aircraft you know, likened to that of a modern day helicopter, but because they wouldn't have had any idea of that technology or what it was they saw, that's where he came up with the whole locust, mm. you know, infestation. Is that is that thing of um, the ancient aliens thing again? It's going exactly, down yeah. there. I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's definitely but it's aliens. aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yes, I mean, I mean, I could have gone down a real rabbit hole with with that stuff, and then completely reading through all aspects of the bible which i'm sure i will do at some point but, but yeah i just think when you when you go back that far and you you you're reading accounts of you know sightings and, and potential encounters even back then mm. and, it, and it carries through even to now if it's all nonsense at some point someone would have gone do you know what this is bollocks and they yeah. would have put a, they would have put a well, stop to it and you would have moved on to the next thing so but it's worth it's worth mentioning as well with regards to the bible is that we're with our advances in technology and our advances in scientific study, we're starting to realize that a lot of the, I say a lot of the, some of the stories that are in the Bible, particularly in the old Testament yes. are starting to ring true. Like through geological study, we're actually able to find that there was a great flood that happened around about yeah, 12,000 yeah. years ago, which I alluded to yeah, in yeah. our first episode we, yeah, when we were right. talking about Gigantopithecus mm. and, not only that, but we're also starting to find through genetic study mm. that these events happened and I get I could go into a whole new other episode about that. So I'm not going to go too much. Exactly, into it. Yeah. Basically, I'm just saying that with advances in scientific technology and study, we're starting to realize that maybe the Bible isn't just a store a book of stories. Mm. Maybe it is a telling of our ancient history. Yeah, and that's that's me, of events that's that me saying that as a person who used to be. Well, I'm still against monotheistic re religion as a mm. as a such. In that you know you've yeah. got to bend your knee to a god and yeah. beg forgiveness for everything. I, you know, you know what I feel about repent that. your sins and all that. Yeah. yeah, and the whole the 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 idea of religion it just doesn't sit very well with me. But yeah, no, that's that. from reading certain things in the Bible and then also reading scientific studies about certain aspects of the Bible and things that we've found out. Mm. Um, so to anyone else listening that doesn't know me personally, probably won't really understand how important that really is for me to say yeah. those sort of things. No, exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's something that has been part of human living for an incredibly long time. We're going to talking about the men in black in, in exactly, particular yeah. and the, the strange phenomena that is that surrounds them. Um, yeah, that's it. I think if it was just too fantastical and if it was just good storytelling, then I think it would have fizzled out, you know, a long time ago and people would have moved on to the next thing or someone would have tried to create mm. something else to replace it. But the fact that, you know, we're going, like I say, we're going right back to, you know, the New Testament, you know, and, and we're still now talking about encounters that happened only 20 years ago. That's a mm. whole lot of history and, and time yeah. where these things are popping up and, and being seen at different technological advances. And like you say, it's only now that we can go back and be like, well, actually, no, that, that did happen. Mm. And, you know, for the pair of us to sit here and say that, you know, the, the Bible is possibly more than just, you know, fantastical Hello, stories, sto fantastical storytelling you know it it has actually got some weight and some truth to it you know i think does you know 
certainly pitches up both of us as to where we, uh, you know, we, what <laughs> side of the fence we land on in terms of yeah. the men well, in black specifically. But um, I think that the men in black over time has been different species of extraterrestrials that have been able to get certain details correct, mm. but for the most part, got it wrong. And yes. so they yeah. haven't been able to pose as humans at all. Yeah. And that's why there are things that are off. They, the look is different. There's even silly encounters of the men in black having drawn lips on them, fa- on their faces, having drawn yeah. actual lips drawn on. Actual and then, they've, then the, the makeup or whatever it is they've used has started melting yeah. on their face. Mm. It's just, I mean, that's horrific. And it's, and it's that's scary in itself. Just yeah. thinking about that. Yeah, someone exactly. standing in front of you, then their face is beginning to melt. Yeah. They're like, yeah. yeah, I'm out of here, sunshine. Drop me out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think we're both in agreement here. Men in yeah. black, they're not human. No. They ain't here to protect us. No. They're, they're here to, to... Well, I suppose they are in a roundabout keep... way, but they want to keep their distance. They, they want to protect us by telling us to not snoop and stick our nose in where it's not wanted. Um, but they're very much here to observe us, you know. To yeah, the craze did that as well, though, didn't they? Well, this is true. <laughs> to you know, replenish our resources and and use what you know possibly isn't you know theirs. But then I guess we can't stake a claim to it either. But no, but no, I think it's yeah, it, it, they're, they're certainly real. I believe um, mm. they're they're not human, um, and they've changed their appearance throughout the course of history to blend in with what they feel would be acceptable at that time, but they've never quite got it right. They've, they've always missed out a detail or two that yeah. if they'd got right, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here doing this podcast now. So I in a way, yeah, I think of... that's where Hollywood might've got it right is they're the cleanup crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty yeah. much. I've, yeah. I think they're much. the cleanup crew that just yeah. come in and just say, right, keep it quiet. Keep it shtum. Yeah. Let's, let's move uh, on. Let's tidy this all up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so no, so that's. I guess that's mm. that's that's our on, episode on the Men yeah, in Black. It's a wrap on that episode. Then I hope uh, those listening have enjoyed it. And uh, yep. yeah, so yeah, so we found the encounters intriguing because we certainly uh, we certainly have. And again, as always, you know, like um, you know, like other listeners have have got involved and you know got into debate and uh, you know, yeah given us their thoughts and theories you know we, we still welcome it you we know, actually really appreciate that because it's it means really, you're no, listening it's awesome. it's, well that's exactly <laughs> it you know when when we get you know called out on certain theories or opinions or you know like yeah, called us out Test like us in the it, mothman you know? episode the you know the the experiment that we recounted to kind of add weight to one of the the, the sort of the theories the false the, memory the, thing. essentially yeah the false memory thing to kind of debunk the sightings yeah, we, we, we got, you know, we got challenged on it. And, you know, I got I entered into a fairly sort of healthy debate with uh, with a friend. So, it's, you know, listener. So it was good. Um, and uh, we so, welcome that. People, you know, we want people to get involved and engage. give us their own in, in opinions yeah, so and thoughts. And if we get things Check wrong, in on us on the socials, you know. We're on Facebook. Yeah. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube as well. Just search yeah. for Cryptid Rambler podcast, or Cryptid Ramblers podcast. Even sorry, yeah, um, agree. And, we'll, and we're also understand. we're also on Discord as well. We've got a Discord channel that's hosted by uh, the Not Another Conspiracy podcast guys. Yeah. Um, we so have shout out channel. to uh, yeah. shout out to Ben, Dean, yeah. and uh, JJ on JJ, that. Yeah. Um, but also shout out to Huxley. Um, he's the moderator on on there he and uh, he he's is. kind enough to do yeah. um the timestamps for each episode and he, he has he, it's yeah, worth reading has. those timestamps as well because he puts his own little spin on it he puts a good well. little spin on the particular segment it's always entertaining thing. it is good to know and if, yeah we do appreciate that because he, he doesn't he doesn't have to he's a moderator no. for the other sort of podcast but it's um it's appreciated nonetheless so yeah uh, so cheers Hux. yeah thank you for Much that appreciated so it's worthwhile us mentioning our next episode I suppose we might as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, it does tie in. And uh, if of anyone course. does know this this name, it's a particular person that we're mm. going to be looking into, and it is someone that's connected with the Men in Black. Yeah, it's connected with the American government, and Indrid it's Cold. also connected with Indrid Cold as well. Yes, he's an author, a prolific author. But we found out just before we started <laughs> he recording. He I is. Mean, yeah, it's worthwhile having a look, guys, and uh, can believe you it. know. Yeah. Um, but we are going to be looking into the myth that is Valiant Thor. 
Indeed we are, yes. The Nushan Traveller. Yeah, an interesting character nonetheless. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to yeah to jumping into this one and um, yeah, seeing what we can find out. Is this another, yeah, another visitor from another world? Is it another fabricated story to throw us mm. off the scent of something else? Or, or yeah, what, what is, is he? Is he friend Who or is- foe? Is he friend or foe? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that'll be that'll be the next uh, episode, which again will come in uh, in a couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, keep listening and uh, and stick around. Yeah, well, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see yeah. you again. Soon. We'll see you then. Bye.